You are listening to the Freedom Podcast with Van Moody. Our desire is that you begin to live in freedom every day. Freedom in your mind, freedom in your finances, freedom from the external pressures of life. Prepare to be transformed as we seek to be free, mind, body, and soul. Let's get started. Good morning. You know, it's not really on if you can't hear it, right? Amen. Good morning to each and every one of you. Come on, let's give God a great big hand clap of praise if you don't mind. It is a joy to be with uh, each and every one of you on this incredible Father's Day. And once again, I think this is not just about honoring fathers, but honoring all men. So help me honor all of the fathers and men that are with us, that are watching online. God bless you. Good morning. Every father, every man, and also happy Juneteenth. Amen. 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 We are celebrating men and fathers today in a very special way, and I'm super excited about um, how we're going to share the the word of God with you this morning. As we begin, I want to call your attention to John 15 and verse 13. John 15 and verse 13 a really important verse of scripture, and I'm going to talk more about this in just a moment, but it says, greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. As I said a moment ago, today we honor not just fathers, but men everywhere. And this should be the greatest holiday of the calendar. I got three amens right there. Two, three, I don't know. It it should be the greatest holiday of the calendar year. But you guys are laughing because you know it's not. (laughs) Father's Day doesn't even come close to the fanfare and the celebration of Mother's Day. Amen. Amen. On Mother's Day, you know it, I know it, the world knows it. On Mother's Day, it's different. On Mother's Day, churches are packed. Brunch and dinner reservations are booked months in advance. And uh, spa and pampering experiences are at capacity all over the world. But on Father's Day, just look around. Churches are not packed. You can walk into any restaurant at any time of the day and get a table. And there are a lot of ties and socks and underwear that is given out. (laughs) The point is fathers, unfortunately, are not celebrated like mothers are. And I believe that the reason that this is the case is because of the state of fatherhood and the state of manhood in the world and particularly in our country. The absence of fathers, the absence of men from the family has reached an epidemic proportion in our country. As a matter of fact, the decline of fatherhood, sociologists and other scholars have all written about it. They've, they've all Uh, commented about it in a variety of ways. Books upon books have been published about it. The decline of fatherhood, the decline of the absence of manhood is a major force behind many of the most disturbing problems that's plaguing America. Crime and juvenile delinquency is one of those things that people point to and say that it is happening because of the absence of fathers. Another example of things like premature sexuality, out of wedlock births among teenagers, deteriorating educational achievements. All of these things ultimately point back to the absence of fathers. I want to share some additional statistics that offer some startling examples. 63% of youth suicides 
are from fatherless homes. That's five times the national average. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes, 32 times the average. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes, 20 times the national average. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. That's nine times the average. 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers, guess where they come? From fatherless homes. Point is that fatherhood and real manhood matters. You can look at those statistics. You can even look at the impact of, of men being in the home, fathers being present as it relates to educational outcomes. The father factor, the man being present, a father being in the house, impacts a child's educational journey. As a matter of fact, fatherless children are twice as likely to drop out of school. Children with fathers who were involved, though, in their life, they are 40% less likely to repeat a grade in school. Children with fathers who are involved, that are present and active in their life, are 70% less likely to drop out of school. Children with involved fathers are more likely to get A's in school. Children with fathers who are active and involved are more likely to not only enjoy school, but also to uh, be present and active in extracurricular activities. Point is, fatherhood and manhood matters. Fathers are the most and first, I would argue, the first and most important as it relates to the presence in, in their lives of children. Particularly when you think about how fathers and men in particular model, teach boys how to be godly men. Fathers, real men, teach even their daughters what healthy male to female relationships should be. There's even a startling stat that I was made aware of recently that scientists are now um, really talking more and more and more about in that girls who grow up with a father in their home get this physically developed later in life than girls who grow up in a home without a father. Because fathers matter. But one of the biggest reasons that we find ourselves here in a society where there's so many men that are absent and fathers that are absent is because many men were not fathered. Many fathers were not fathered. As a matter of fact, the root word from which we get the word paternal, when we start talking about the paternal side of your family, that's your father's side. The root word from which we get the word paternal is the same word from which we get the word pattern. Many men fail in their responsibility, get this, to be paternal because they never had a pattern. That's so good. In one of the most transparent conversations that I ever had with my father, about five to seven years ago, he came over to Birmingham, spent a little time with me and my family, and we were sitting in my living room playing chess and just sharing. And he said to me, he said, you know, son, I never knew how to be a father. He said, I never had it modeled for me. He said, in fact, he had only met his father twice in his entire life, only seen his father twice. He told me about the time that he was a kid playing in the front yard, maybe three or four years old, and how his father came over to, to his home and I guess uh, maybe gave some money to his mother, my grandmother, and he said that was the first time he met his father. Then he said the second time that he saw his father and the final time he saw his father was when he was in high school. And he got word that 
his father was on his deathbed and getting ready to pass, and he went to the hospital to see his dad right before he passed. And my father said, you know what? He said, that, that's it. He said, those are the only two times I ever saw my father. He said, so I didn't really know how to be a father. That was also when I learned that my father's father was actually from Alabama. But in that transparent conversation, my father shared that with me because that was his way of saying, you know, I know I, I, I messed up. I didn't do as good as I could have as a father, but I didn't even have the pattern. Many men fail in their responsibility to be men, or to be paternal, because they never had the pattern. But what we want to deal with this morning on this celebration of men and Father's Day is that while the absence of men, the absence of fathers from the family is, is an experience that a lot of men have shared. A lot of men have this same experience in common. But while this is the experience of many men, it doesn't have to be the excuse. That's so important. I'm going to say it again. Even though that is the experience, it doesn't have to be the excuse. Because while there are many men who perhaps like my father or like myself didn't grow up with their father or maybe didn't have the best example, some men did, but, but far too many did not, the benefit that we have as believers is that the greatest book on manhood and fatherhood that has ever been written is the word of God. And so on today, what we're going to do that's really special, and I'm super excited about it, is I've, I've invited some amazing men, some amazing fathers to join me here on the platform, and we're going to share from our own experience, biblically, what, what's been that pattern that we have ascribed to that's helped us to be the men and the fathers that we all are. So I want to ask you to welcome to the platform Pastor Jamar Jones. Pastor Aaron Frazier, Brother Demetrius Jones, and Coach Danton Jackson. Come on, let's give them a hand clap of praise as they come. The poorest person on earth is the person without faith. Humanity has been led to a critical crossroad, wondering if there is an alternative to the world as we have made it. In essence, a lot of people have simply stopped believing in anything or anyone. They have simply lost their faith in faith. While it is absolutely tragic to lose a job, to lose a spouse, to lose a child or home or business, these are not the greatest losses one can experience. The greatest loss in life is the loss of belief. When one loses the ability to believe, one loses both faith and hope. When hope is lost, purpose is canceled and life is robbed of meaning. Belief is the raw material required for commitment, persistence, and faithfulness. No man or woman can live beyond their belief, for without faith, all hope is lost. As a person whose life has been radically transformed by genuine faith, Dr. Van Moody has a passion for helping people understand what real biblical faith is and why it's so important. If our belief is gone, our life shrinks because possibilities are limited and our expectations are low. Believe is a must read for anyone wanting to understand real biblical faith in order to believe big and live a life full of endless possibilities and limitless opportunities. Visit vanmoody.org or anywhere books are sold to get your copy today. All right. Let me first of all say, number one, that I think, church, we ought to give God praise because you can look on this platform, and not only on this platform, but also in our church, you see men, Amen. real men. Amen. Amen. I, I've, I've grown up in church, and I, and I can say that I haven't always been a part of church where, where you can look around and see a lot of strong men that love the Lord. Um, those of you that have grown up in church understand you've probably seen some other things. Uh, amen. But I'm grateful that not only do you have incredible men on this platform, but, but our church is very, very blessed because it's, it's a church full of incredible men. Incredible men. And my life has been blessed to just be a part of, 
part of these incredible leaders and men uh, as my life has been blessed by all of you on this platform. So we know that the experience for a lot of men, not every man, but the experience for many men is that they've grown up without a, a, a male figure or a father, but it doesn't have to be the excuse. All of our lives have been marked by, by a biblical pattern, and I'd love for us to, to talk about what that, that biblical pattern is, and we can go in any particular order. I mean, I'll start with you, Pastor Aaron. What, what, what's been that biblical pattern for you? Maybe it's a biblical figure or a story that's grounded your life and, and really shaped you as, as a man and as a father. Um, you, my dad always used to tell me to pray for wisdom. And um, even as a young man, pray for wisdom. And so when I think about in scripture, uh, David in particular as a father, um, we know David has uh, these moral failures and he messed up. And even as a dad to some of his children, he, he really wasn't the best dad. But there's this interesting part right before He's getting ready to pass the baton to his, his son, Solomon. That's where we really see David as this father figure and what he set up um, as a blueprint. I think that word pattern was right on exactly where the Lord had me because David was leaving a, blue, a blueprint both in terms of how to build the temple, but then also this blueprint of how to pray for wisdom. Um, and that actually is what Solomon carried out the blueprint to build the temple, but he also carried out the blueprint to ask God for wisdom when he had the opportunity to do so. And so that was something that really been, it sticks out with me because of all the things to ask for, the, all the things that my dad t- could tell me to pray for, that was the one thing that he said to make sure to pray for wisdom and the ability to, to be wise in situations and circumstances. And so... Um, that's something I want to, I try to govern myself and try to, to lead as, 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 as being wise um, and walking in wisdom, but it's also something I want my children to do. That's good. That's good. Um, Brother Demetrius, I mean, you are a man of God with a very powerful story. Um, what's, what's been that biblical character or that biblical blueprint for you? Well, I would say... The biblical blueprint for me was uh, Joshua 24 and 15, where he he basically summarized and said that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And in that in that scripture, you learn that that Joshua was young and seen everything from the children of Israel, how they messed up, how God constantly came back in. And he also restored them. So basically at the end of his life, he was literally telling the children that you can go and praise all the other gods if you want to, but for me and my house, we're going to praise God. And the reason why it resonated with me was because in my earlier years, I was married and fell horribly. And the reason why I fell horribly, because a lot like what you were talking about earlier is that my dad didn't know how to father. So I literally was mirroring the things that he was doing on my own understanding. And it wasn't until the grace of God that he gave me a second chance. So now in this second marriage, I have been flourishing by just going by all the principles of God and doing everything in God's way to the point that it has helped me financially, it has helped me spiritually, emotionally, and just celebrating a a nine day year old child. That's, that's real talk, Brian. That's real talk. Let me, let me ask a question, and then obviously other, other panelists, you guys can jump in. What jumps out at me is the interconnectedness between what you both have shared, because the desire to do it God's way and the, the blessing and the benefit that you're seeing in your life and in your family, it's, it's a desire that is driven but it's, it's countercultural because a lot of what we see in the world and in culture and particularly a lot of what is you know, pushed out there about men and in particular black men is not positive, um, it's not biblical, 
but the fact that asking God for wisdom and, and walking that out, you know, seeing that, hey, I had a go round in my first marriage, it, 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 it failed because I was probably following the world standards as opposed to following God's standards. How has your life been different or what have you felt to be some of the like saving graces or clear evidence that, that God is honoring your call and cry for, for wisdom and your decision that God, I'm going to do it your way. I see God show up in so many times that when I wanted to do it my own way and still mess up, that it was still God's grace that kept me and gave me another opportunity. And because he gave me another opportunity, it was another opportunity to, to walk out in the wisdom that he gave me the first time. You know, there's so many times I had my own wisdom. And then, of course, the world has its own wisdom yeah. about how to do things. And, and even the way you're supposed to be thinking, the way you're supposed to carry out things. And when I walked in myself or I walked in what the world was telling me, I was unable to be successful. There was no possibility for success. And yet God gave me another opportunity. And I thank God for the grace to be able to say, you know, even when I was messed up, right? I messed it up the first time or the second time or the third time, but God still gave me grace to walk in the wisdom. That's good, man. What, what's been the, one of the biggest saving graces or just evidence of God honoring that decision to do it his way? I would say this. Uh, last summer, I was leading the fellowship. And a lot of times when you lead group, small groups, you're thinking that you're actually leading them, but they actually was leading me. Because we got to a segment where it talks about resentment. And now that my mom has fell ill, it has caused me and my dad to have a closer bond. And I had went back and asked a lot of questions. And there were times that he all, I mean, he was always working, always working. And then on, on the weekends, that was his rest time. So of course, it was very minimal times that, that, that we actually had any actions. And my mom was the one that was doing everything. So when I went back and asked him, I said, well, dad, you know, I never remember you ever telling me you love me. And he was like, what were you talking about? You had a roof over your head, and I took care of your clothes, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and then it came full circle with my seven-year-old. She played softball. And of course, I have a, a very hectic schedule. And I got out there probably like the third inning, but mm. I missed her home run. And she sat out there with an attitude the whole time. <laughs> I mean, the whole time. And I finally went over to the dugout, and I was like, what's wrong with you? And she was like, you missed my home run. And I was like, you ought to be happy that I made it to, to the game. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it hit me yeah. that it wasn't her responsibility of everything I have going on. I have to put it in myself to make it whatever yeah, to man. be on time and there's a difference between presence and present and the problem is yes we have to be men and work all the time and and and, and, and we have to do this and all that but it's a it's a stronger bond when presence mm. being in the presence of the children instead of just being present yeah. Yeah, man. bro that's big time man That is big time. Lord have mercy. Yeah. So much I want to say there. Yeah. Woo! Jesus. If y'all haven't gotten the word now, I don't know. Y'all missed it. You hear me? Um, Coach, an incredible man. You've led an incredible life, um, not only as a leader, but as a coach, mentoring young men. And now in your role uh, as a head coach at Talladega and just You've been in basketball and you've led programs and you know, uh, you've been a big influence even in my son's life, helping me to, to help him. And so what's been, the, what's been that biblical pattern for you um, when it comes to manhood? Uh, you know, I think it, I think it starts with, with my father. I had a really good foundation um, where he introduced me to God um, and the, dis the discipline he had inside of me, that he put inside of me. I think the, the passage that in, you know, that I always refer back to is, um, is a story of, of Joseph and Mary when they were getting ready to get married. And, um, and Joseph had to make a decision. He had a foundation 
uh, in the Lord, and he had to make a decision to follow God and to follow God's word, even though it, it wasn't popular. Uh, he did an unbelievable job of, of not only protecting Mary and, and protecting the Son of God uh, in the early stages, um, but also, you know, with me in my life, um, it comes to the point where I get an opportunity to really mentor and father a lot of young men who don't have fathers. Um, and it's a it's large responsibility, and it goes back to always diving into the Word and understanding what our role is, what my role is in regards to mentoring those young men when they come into the locker room. Because a lot of times, that's the first time they get the chance to see really a, a, a black male with any type of leadership. Mm. Um, and it's, 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 it, it comes over and over again when they have a ton of questions for you. Um, and so that, that scripture, that passage, that example in the Bible is an example for me because of the responsibility that I'm given, that I'm entrusted with um, to mentor young people. And I think that's, that's the scripture that I always lean back to every time we begin a season, every time a guy comes in the office to talk about something, um, even this morning, you know, with the, with the young man who doesn't have a great relationship with his dad, just how to manage that, um, how to honor your father regardless of, of what they do, um, and let God take care of everything else. But that's the passage that every day that I think about um, when I mentor um, young men, and sometimes I'm the only example that they may see, um, but it's a big responsibility. Yeah. What is... You just, you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, recognizing that you are probably the only father figure that a lot of these guys have seen. What, what, it is a big responsibility, but what does that weight mean for you? I mean, in terms of how you carry that weight, because you are fathering these guys, even though they're not your biological children. Very similarly to Joseph, right? Um, not Jesus was not a seed, but Jesus was a son. How do you process through that? I mean, what does that mean for you in your own walk as a man, knowing that you have to be that example? Um, you know, it's exciting. It's, it is a burden, but it's exciting. Um, and I think that, you know, by staying grounded in the word, that's where the foundation comes from. Because you understand that if not you, then who? Mm. Um, if not you, that's then good. who? Um, and it becomes a joy because you start seeing the development in young people's lives. Um, and it's amazing. I have a close friend, he's a 15-year NBA, uh, NBA player. And I tell him all the time, I said, the most proudest thing I have of you, because your, 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 your mom died when you were six years old and his dad didn't want to be a piece of him, is what he's being to his children. And I said, that's the biggest miracle that I see in you. Um, and it's just a joy being able to watch that, to see that, because we talk about breaking the curse, breaking, breaking that, and being a good dad. And, and where does it start? It starts with every male in the room taking on responsibility when they have an opportunity to share. And you see the joy. You may not see it right away, but you see the joy when they grow up and get older. And it's just amazing how he's broken the chain with his family. Um, and I often ask him, where did you get it from? Because you did not have an example. Uh, but it's amazing when you do God's work and God does amazing things in other people. That's huge, man. That's huge. Pastor Jay, you're my brother from another mother. Uh, we share a very similar um, story in growing up without our fathers. And I'd love for you to share what, what's been that biblical pattern for you? Well, um, today is a very emotional day because it's Father's Day. Uh, and it was on this day about 1981 that my father had anointed my hands in a hospital on his deathbed. I was three years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, he prophesied in the presence of my siblings that I would play a piano, that I would travel the world. Um, he died just a couple days later, right? Uh, so every time I reflect on Father's Day now, um, and I'm going to answer the question, I just need to get that out. No, get it out, bro. <laughs> get it out. <laughs> I'm going to answer the question. Um, but as I reflect here on Father's Day, that thought came to my mind. 
Now, as we turn to the Bible, I take Joseph, the Old Testament Joseph, who is really, uh, he resembles my biblical autobiography, if you will, because I was separated from my father, he was separated from his, mm. along the journey. Uh, and through separation, he had to mature as a man. Potiphar's house, then he got, went to prison, did some time, then he ends up in the king, uh, in the king's house, and actually ends up becoming, as the scripture says, a father to Pharaoh. Yes. Right. What I got out of Joseph's story, and the reason Joseph is a pattern for me, is because he always resembled amazing sonship. Think about it. Potiphar uh, really could have killed him, yep. you know, yep. with the little episode with his wife. But what he did was, in a loving way, threw him in prison yep. to preserve his life. You know, he gets in prison, and then there's a, you know, captain of the guards like, oh, man. You know, he was always modeling sonship until he could model fatherhood. Now, here's the scripture for me. It's Genesis 45.3. Joseph after going through the whole drama with his brothers and all that good stuff. It's a great story. You should read it. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> but after going through the drama with his brothers, he says, he, he says, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? And as we think about patterns in the pattern, that scripture speaks, it, it, it always spoke to me in such this way. I know who I am. All right. I've become, I've been an excellent son. You know, I'm now the ruler in Egypt and I'm a gifted person. But yet there remains this question because I've not had a pattern yeah. to know, is my father still living? Is the good in him in me? Or is the bad in him in me? I don't know. And he asked that question. And he asked the question and his brothers just go right by it. They don't even pay attention to it. They don't, they don't even acknowledge it because they're still, you know, dealing with their own turmoil for what they had done to him, you know. But the fact that he asked that question, he tells them, I am Joseph, is my father still living? And I think every day that I live and I raise my own children, I'm asking myself that question. Is my father still living? The things that he spoke over my life, is he still living? When my son walks in the room, and my, my son is, he's a big brute football player, but he would hate that I'm saying this, but he's like a lovey-dovey dude, <laughs> you know, with his father. Yeah. You know, he tries to play hard, but every time he sees me, yeah, he gives me a hug, he embraces me, and I'm asking my question, yeah, this question, yeah, I'm Jamar, but is my father still living? You know, so that's my biblical pattern. That's so good. Um, you know, all of you, what strikes me about everything that you shared is this hardcore kind of foundation that runs through all of it to live for God and to make sure that you're making those decisions that reflect that. You know, when you start talking about accepting that responsibility, um, if, if not you, who? start talking about, hey, it's really not about how busy my schedule is. My presence is, su is super important. Yeah. You know, what you model to your children in, in raising them, but answering that question is, is my father still alive? But then also just the hunger for wisdom and the appreciation of God's grace. For a lot of men that may be watching us or listening, I am struck by how powerful your stories are, but then we still live in a world where men are so absent, where men don't care whether or not they are there, or men are present, but they're still absent at the same time. Mm -hmm. There are so many other priorities in life that that take precedent or that they allow to take precedent over being fully present for their children or being fully present for their kids or even kids that may not be theirs biologically. We know that we've got to turn it around. Yeah. 
we know, as I cited earlier, all of the stats that point to the pain and the collateral damage of the absence of fathers. What would you all say to men that are in this congregation that may be online on this Father's Day when we start talking about their responsibility and the importance of it and the benefit of it to their own personal lives? Like, what, what, what would be your word to them? I'm going to jump in here. I, um, I would say to you, man that is watching or may, maybe that's in this room, you need to understand this one thing. Wherever you are right now as a result of your pattern, be it negative or positive, but really on the negative side, we have to come to grips with the fact that it's not your fault. I want you to understand this. It's not your fault. Mm -hmm. There's a scripture in John where Jesus, you know, they bring this man that was born blind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're asking, well, who's responsible for this? Him or his parents, who's responsible? Yeah. yeah it's, not, it's not his fault. It was only you've been brought here today to watch us so that God can bring about glory in your life. That's good, man. Yeah. And the glory comes through now the restoration to you as a father. Now you have brothers that you can get a pattern from and then other men that you can pattern your life. And now you can start to walk forward. That's how God gets the glory. That's what I would offer. That's good. I, I think the biggest thing, too, is, is, is simple. It's simple, but I guess it's difficult. It's Jesus. Um, it's coming to him, getting to know him. Um, and then through that, he'll put people in your lives to, to reinforce these things. You know, I, I'm a guy, my, my dad passed away in 2005. And, you know, I left home when I was 18 and went to New Orleans to go to school. But I look at all the men, the Christian men that were in my life that gave me a great example. You know, I, I work uh, Bishop's son out, and he thinks I work his son out. He actually works me out. <laughs> because every step of the way, I'm watching how much time he's spending with his son. Wow. And it's amazing, not only being present, but, but being engaged, being where your feet are. Yeah. I tell my players that all the time, you know, be where your feet are. You know, be there and be where your feet are, and that lives, leaves a level of consistency. Um, you know, I remember we met a long time ago um, in a small group, one of my first small groups in, in church. But we don't exactly talk every week, but my eyes, when I come to church and see the example and the people that are in my life, at times speaking, at times seeing, is so powerful. And that's what I ask our guys to lean on because I think success leaves footsteps. You know? That's so good. Um, you know, we... we uh, Every morning we have the, the, the scripture that we read every morning, but when you start looking at the stories of powerful men, masculine men in the Bible, and then stories of, of men who didn't do it the right way, the consequences to that, it starts to change a lot. And we think, no, this is, although it was back in history, these things are happening today and are happening in our lives. And we have decisions that we can make to either go right or left. So I think those are the really things, but I think that at the bottom of it, crust is, is just our relationship with Jesus, our relationship with God, and how it continues to grow and manifest in our lives, and it changes us daily. And those are the things that we share with our people, share with our young people, and try to bring them, because I think it's important that we have people in their lives right next to them that are great examples versus the world's examples. Yeah, that's, good. that's good. I would share this. Brothers, it's okay to look like your father. Mm. A lot of times that term is used and sometimes it's used in the negative. Yeah. Because our earthly example or the earthly father that some of us may have had, some people may have had, you don't want to look like that person when you look at that person in the mirror. You don't want to see those features. You don't want to be reminded of who that person was and who that person is in your own life. But in essence, the more that we get in our intimate relationship with Christ, the more that we look like our Father. That's good, bro. That's good. That's good, man. At some point, if we would just flip the script to understand 
that every time we look in the mirror, that we can look more and more like our Father in heaven. That it's going to be okay if we have our physical features that look like our earthly Father here on earth. Because the true model and the true essence, the true, the true Father that we all have, is still the one that reigns on the throne. Regardless if you have that relationship with your earthly father in heaven, he's the one that gets honor. He's the one that gets glory. So it's okay to look like your dad. That's good, man. That's good. Well, that's for me. I would, I would tell you to go by the same example I did. Is like I said, I didn't necessarily have a pattern, and I realized that I wanted more than what I had, so I had to went, go search for patterns. And searching for patterns was coming around, being in the room with individuals, as he was saying, watching them and, and learning from them and then getting in the Word and seeing what, they, what the Word says. Because a lot of us growing up have the thought process of, I want more from my kids than what I didn't have. But the question is, have you ever asked your kid, is that what they really want? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we can want a whole lot of things. I mean, my oldest, my 15-year-old, I wanted her to play basketball. <laughs> but that ain't what she wanted to do. Yeah. So the question that I do, I, I do on a regular basis is I go to them and just do a checkup and be like, how am I serving you as a dad? And what can I do for you to be, to be better? That's good. So I know we have that communication, you know, because every child is not the same and everybody is not going to want the same things. So to have that in-depth conversation to understand where we both stand in, in life and know what is expected of me, where we won't have to walk around with unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's funny, you guys all kind of hit on, um, I haven't given you my, my pattern, uh, and you all hit on it, though. Um, that's why I read John uh, earlier, John 15, 13, uh, greater love hath no man. I love the King James Version that stresses that hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, growing up without my father, in many ways, drove me, and I think it was one of the tools that God used to drive me into a more deeper, real, intimate relationship with my Heavenly Father. And when I think about the pattern of, of what it means to be a man and a father, I always come back to Jesus. And I come back specifically not only to his life and example, but his willingness to sacrifice, to lay his life down. I think one of the worst things that a man can be is selfish. And I reflect on it, you know, when you think about the life of Jesus compared to the life of Adam. God gives Adam the assignment. He gives Adam the responsibility. He gives Adam the mandate. But Adam doesn't lay his life down. Satan slithers in and starts talking to Eve about eating from that tree that was forbidden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam is mysteriously missing in that exchange. And then when Eve takes the apple, eats it, and then offers it to Adam, he's silent. He doesn't speak up and say, well, no, we can't do this. The Lord said. But he had the assignment. What his responsibility was supposed to, to be at that point was to lay his life down and say, no, no, no. As for me and my house, we're going to do it this way. We're going we're gonna to serve the Lord. And he didn't do it. And his unwillingness to sacrifice and lay his life down resulted in him losing his family. Jesus, the second Adam, comes and he willingly lays his life down. And in his willingness to sacrifice and lay his life down, he saves his family. I think the pattern for me, when you talk about how much time I spend with my son and, and, and my kids... You know, my, my, my life revolves around my presence. You know, I never wanted my children to feel like they were second to the church or to my responsibilities. Um, I always wanted them and my wife to know that they were my number one priority and still are. And so for me, the pattern is 
I have to lay my life down for them. You know, that, that the life that I live is not about me. It's about how I am sacrificing for them. And then when you think about this whole image of laying your life down, not only does it denote sacrifice, but it also denotes when, when someone is laying down their life, it becomes a platform for us to stand on. And I do believe whether or not our kids want what we want for them, I do think that we have a responsibility to live our life and to lay it down in such a way that they can, they can reach higher, that, that they don't start where we started, right? That they have a, a head start or a shoulder start or a leg up, however you want to define it, because we lived. And for me, that's what we see through Christ. He bridges the gap that sin created between us and the Father. You know, because we are all really living out the responsibility that he laid down in dying for us. Like, not only do we have the relationship with our Heavenly Father because of him, but we're able to reach farther, live a better life. Our life is not defined by sin and, you know, all of the negativity that the enemy desires, but we're able to live our best life because he laid his life down. I think that's the pattern for me. Thank you for listening to the Freedom Podcast. If you find inspiration, education, or fulfillment in our episodes, consider becoming a partner. Your donation ensures that we will continue delivering quality content alongside some of today's leading experts. Connect with us by becoming a Freedom Friend, a Freedom Champion, or a Freedom Funder. Together, we will continue to produce content that provides hope and healing. Thank you. Your generosity is appreciated.